All right, good morning, Placerita Bible Church. We are ready to begin our service. Let's stand together. Look forward to being together with you guys all week, singing these songs, lifting our voices, lifting our hearts, sitting under the preaching of the word, being the church together. Let's sing I Stand Amazed. my sin and places it on him. The Father gives his only son to bleed for Adam's race. I stand amazed God chose to say Amen. Well, welcome to Placerita Bible Church. Great to have you with us this morning. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Aren't you glad that Jesus died and that he was raised again and he came to save us from our sins? That's what we're here to sing about this morning. And we want to welcome you again if you are visiting. This is uh, Placerita, and pretty soon we're going to be in a brand new building. 
So we can't wait to get there. Praise the Lord for that. We're excited. We're going to keep you posted week to week, all right? So stay, stay uh, posted on your email. We send out a weekly uh, email update about what we're doing every Sunday. So make sure you take a special look at that uh, this uh, coming Friday. But just kind of hang with us there. We're in the very last part of some final touches, and we'll keep you informed uh, when we'll be in that new building. But we're glad that you're with us this morning. We're here to exalt the Lord Jesus together, and we're excited to run through a couple of announcements as well. The first thing I want to let you know about is we have a 2021 summer mission trip to Utah. So if you're interested in heading to Utah this summer, we're going to work with one of our missionaries, Dave Stolarski, who's a pastor there. And we have Keith Shanks, who's with us. He's leading the team. He'll be out in the patio this morning. If you have any interest at all in going, it's going to be July the 31st through August the 4th. And we'd love to have you join us on that short-term trip. Also, we wanted to let you know that we are hosting a conference called Care of Souls uh, that's a biblical counseling conference, the reformation of biblical counseling, uh, trying to get back to the Bible. That's what biblical counseling is all about. And we need a few volunteers. So if you're interested in serving in that conference, which will hopefully be in our new facility, June the 10th, 11th, and 12th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday set up, and the conference will be Friday, Saturday. Just make sure you reach out to Mark Smith. He's our, our director of our counseling ministry. He'd love to implement your help in uh, hosting, helping us host that conference in June. So to reach out to Mark Smith this morning. And we have a little table outside with uh, Adriana and TJ, a couple of our MABC students who will be able to answer any questions you may have about that. And then youth group, we wanted to let you know we're heading to Camp Regen. Camp Regeneration is with Grace Community Church. It's in Glorietta, New Mexico. We wanted you to just save the date, July 31st through August 4th. So parents, as you're planning your summer vacation and planning to get out of town, make sure that your high school students don't miss this opportunity. It's a phenomenal camp. We're going to bus them out there, bus them back. And while they're there, they'll hear from John MacArthur, Austin Duncan, and Josh Petros. It's a phenomenal camp. Again, we just want you to save the date. If you have questions, you can talk to Zach, who is going to be uh, answering everything that you need to know about that summer camp. And talking about Zach Harris, I'm going to invite him up because he's got a special announcement that he wants to make to you this morning. So, Zach, share with us, man, what's going on in your life. I just want to say I'm so thankful for this church, so thankful for each and every one of you. Um, for the last few months, Christine and I have been um, considering a position with the Master's University. A position opened up in Israel with the IVEX program. So we have applied for this position, and it looks like things will be moving forward. So we're prayerfully considering um, going to Israel in July. That's the plan. Um, which is hard. It makes how much we love you guys and how much this church feels like a family makes that announcement really hard. We, we really, um, truly had to think through and pray through this decision because of how much we've loved serving the church, how much we've loved the youth ministry and everyone outside of youth ministry as well. And so that's, that's where we're at. Um, we've, we went to IBEX as students, and we loved the IBEX program. We fell in love in the IBEX program, and we've always talked about going back. Um, when we were at Masters, there was a saying, and that saying was, it's not if you go to IBEX, it's when you go to IBEX. And for you guys, it's not if you come and visit us, it's when you come and visit us. So... That's my announcement. We'll probably be answering more questions moving forward, but I want you guys to know that you can be praying for us. Pray for my wife and I. Christine's doing like three weeks with a baby, um, so we, we'll be taking our three girls there with us, and so we need a lot of prayer, and yeah, there we go. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. We're excited for him, but we're really bummed out as a church. We love Zach and Christine. They've done such a great job with our youth ministry. Uh, There's been conversations that have been going on since uh, February. I think Zach came into my office and said, hey, the master's is talking to me about this. What do you think? And I just said, no, you can't do it, bro. You have to stay right here. Uh, so after I heard a little bit more about the opportunity and their heart, I'm like, of course you got to go. That's a phenomenal opportunity. We'd love for you guys to do that. Uh, I did try to double his salary. Still didn't help. So, um, so we're looking, by the way, we're looking for a new guy to help fill this position. So uh, you guys as parents of youth already know about this because Zach announced it on Wednesday and sent you guys an email 
And uh, so just know as a church leadership team, we're excited about looking at several different candidates. We've narrowed down to just maybe a last uh, person or two that we're looking at. And um, just pray for wisdom, pray for guidance for our church. We know that God's going to provide uh, the right guy in the right time. And we'll be excited to let you know more about that as things are moving kind of quick in that area and, and that things are developing there as well. So, but Zach, Christine, we love you. We'll be able to say goodbye and all that uh, later. They're thinking about um, July, so sometime in July. So you still be with us during that time, and we get to see another another baby, Christine. We're so excited about you uh, giving birth in three weeks. It's just so cool to think about uh, how God uh, just grows families and raises people up, and moves them on, and that's all for His glory. Amen. All right. Well, one last announcement is we have a quick video for a women's conference that's going to be coming up. The very first conference that's going to be hosted, Lord willing, in our new building. So I hope you enjoy the video. And then Shana Anderson is going to come up and tell you a little bit more about the women's conference. Well, ladies, my name is Chris Gerton, and I have the marvelous honor of being invited to come open the Word of God with you on May 21st and 22nd. We're going to have a marvelous time as we discover and develop the spiritual gifts that Jesus Christ chose for you at salvation. The Holy Spirit brought those to you so that you can grow in them and serve His body. So please don't miss out. Make every effort to join us. We're going to have a life-changing time around His Word. I'll see you then. Morning. I am Shana Anderson. I am responsible for the retreats for uh, Women's Council. And as you can see, we have an adorable guest speaker coming. I am so excited that Chris Gertzen is going to be joining us. Um, she has written this book, Equipped to Serve, which is actually a workbook. And it really helps uh, women understand who they are in Christ, how God has gifted them, the gifts that he has give to, given to them. And even if you already know what your spiritual gift is, I took the, um, the guide that she gives is called the Spiritual Gift Discovery Guide. It's a questionnaire that helps you uh, determine and evaluate your spiritual gift. I was surprised. Um, my, there was one in my top three that I was actually quite stunned at. And and I'm looking forward. It actually just gave me more excitement to um, dig into God's word to understand how to utilize this spiritual gift. And that's what we want for each one of you ladies. As we start in our new church building, there's several of you who are new. We want to be unified in Christ, exercising our spiritual gifts to the glory of God for the benefit of others. And so um, as part of this retreat, which is May 21st and 22nd, um, in preparation for that, we are asking you to do a little bit of homework. Um, there's a couple of videos and this little gift guide. Was that my hook to get off? <laughs> um, our spiritual gift discovery guide. Go through your so that as you go to the uh, retreat, you're prepared for your guide. And then um, let's see. So there's two videos. The, the guide, the retreat is May 21st and 22nd. It's not overnight. It will be at the church. So Friday night from 5.30 to 9, Saturday morning 8 30 to 3 30. Um, the cost of 72 dollars covers all of our meals covers uh the book you will get the book and um a special gift and then join us after the retreat so we're utilizing the retreat as a springboard for our summer workshop in place of our traditional book fest we decided this was so valuable we wanted our ladies to spend uh, some time going through this workshop together. So starting Tuesday, June 1st, um, each Tuesday through the month of June, we'll be doing a five-week workshop. You don't have to do the retreat to do the workshop. You don't have to do the workshop in order to go to the retreat. But if you want the full benefit of all, please do both. So I'll be outside helping with signups. You can go on to the website and sign up there. And then, of course, find us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much. Thanks, Shana. Well, I, I guess we got to be in that new building if the women's conference is going to happen there. So you guys uh, just keep praying for us. We might be in this next week. The reason I'm not saying it is because, as you know, every week we're like, oh, it's going to take a little bit longer. So just stay 
texted, we're going to trust the Lord with that. We're getting so close. We're so excited, and uh, we're excited about the ladies' retreat. It's going to be awesome. And um, so if you have a Bible, why don't I invite you to open up to Psalm 119. We've been reading through this chapter together, and uh, you can stand with me in honor of God's Word. And today we're going to look at verses 137 through 144. So Psalm 119, starting in verse 137. Here's what the psalmist writes. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me, but have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And Father, we just want to thank you for this psalm, this little section here of Psalm 119 just reminds us that you are righteous and that your rules are righteous, which means, God, we want to adore Christ, and we want to look to your word, and we want to thank you for the law of Christ that reminds us that we're to love you and love each other. And we just thank you that your promise is well tried, and as your servants, we love your law, God. And even though we might be despised in this world, as this psalm talks about, we might still face trouble and anguish, uh, but we know that your commandments, your word, it's our delight because you promise us in your word, to always love us, to never abandon us, to forgive us when we sin and when we confess those sins to you, that you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, we thank you that in a world that's falling apart and in a world that, that uh, has uh, high highs and low lows, that you're our constant source of hope and that you're our constant rock and our anchor and that we don't have to be afraid today and that we don't have to be anxious today, God, that we trust in you, and we want to tell you that we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're desiring for you to continue to do a work in us, God, as you would transform us more and more into the image of your Son. We just want to be like Christ, and so, God, we just thank you for the security that you give us in your word, and we thank you for the fellowship that we have right here Lasserita Bible Church. God, we're praying for all these upcoming transitions as we think about Zach and Christine moving to Israel, about them having a new baby, and about uh, all that's going on in their life. Would you just bless them? Would you encourage them? Would you give them great wisdom? Would you help them to just enjoy these next few months of, of, of uh, transition and just pray your blessings on them? God, we pray for our youth group and for our church as we think about hiring a new person to take that spot. We pray for your wisdom and we pray for unity of mind as our elders have been discussing a couple of different candidates and just kind of zeroing in maybe on one guy that you would uh, provide the right, uh, the right timing in all of uh, the moving parts of our church. God, we thank you for the women ministry coming up. We do pray it would be an incredible time with Chris coming out, and we're thankful for Shana and all the others who are working so hard, and uh, we pray for that Care of Souls conference as well, Lord. We know that you're in control of all of these things, and we pray that you would be exalted in our hearts, Lord, today as we're here to just worship you and to love you and to, to praise you, and we're, we're thankful that we're not alone, God. We want to pray for all the churches in Santa Clarita this morning, and especially Church of the Canyons who's still looking for a new pastor. God, give them wisdom. Give them grace. Allow them to find the right uh, man that you would bring to their church to help preach the word and shepherd the flock. And we want to thank you for our missionaries that we're sending out all over this globe. We're grateful to support Bob and Lynn Trout, who served you faithfully for 40 plus years with ABWE. And as they'll be in town this week, and some of us will be able to interact with them. We just pray your blessings on their life, their ministry, their, their, uh, their work with ABWE, and just the opportunity to uh, have a little time with them this week. So God, right now, I just pray as we continue to sing songs that you would flood our hearts and our minds with gratitude, that you would fill our spirits with a, a, a spirit of praise. Thank you for giving us the oil of gladness. And so today we're here to worship you and to sing these songs out with hearts that have been transformed and with spirits, again, that are filled every moment of every day with the Holy Spirit. And so God, as we sing, again, be exalted in our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, you guys. Let's stand to our feet as we continue to sing. Just thinking about, you know, we've been reading as Pastor Adam just said through Psalm 119 for quite some time, 
right? It's long, and it's incredible. And to hear the psalmist delight in the word of God like that, to delight in the law. Now, people, what is the first and primary purpose of God's law? It is to crush us in our sin and show us our need for a savior. So to the only way that someone could rejoice and delight in God's law like that is if you are no longer under its condemnation, right? And that's who we are in Christ. We know that the righteous requirement of that law that crushes us into the ground in our sin has been satisfied on our behalf. And so we delight in it. We love it. Let's sing this song. You ready, Cora? All right, go. i 
seat for inch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.
pictures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with the sea. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou burn sun. Day. Appreciate you guys uh, leading us, and I uh, just saw a couple over here. I didn't realize you guys were here this morning. Alan, how are you doing, man? Are you here by yourself? No. Oh, there's Sylvia. Hey, guys, how are you? Welcome back to Placerita. Alan was the coach at uh, Masters in volleyball, and then they moved back to Slovenia, and they're back visiting for a little bit, not to Slovenia, to where? 
Latvia, my man. I always, always said that, didn't I? So, hey, welcome back. Good to have you guys with us this morning. So, hey, we have an opportunity this morning to hear from T.J. Smith. So, T.J. and Karen Smith have been here at our church for a long time. They were servants, uh, missionaries in India for a season, and they've been back with us here at the last uh, three, almost four years? three years, and now we're sending them out to Dubai. So we're going to be sending them out. They're going to leave in a little bit over a month, uh, or, well, you can tell us probably better than I can, TJ, all of the details, but I wanted TJ to preach one last time uh, before they head out. We'll get to say goodbye, I think, a little bit uh, right before they leave, but we thought this would be a good Sunday for you to come, bring the word, and uh, we're excited about having you. Let's give a warm welcome to TJ Smith. Love you, brother. Thanks, brother. Well, good morning, good morning. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy to be with you again today. Uh, my wife and I, uh, in 2005, you guys sent us out to the country of India, and uh, it's, it's just a, a startling thing. Some of you were with us on that, that commissioning back then, and, and so even now, in the year 2021, as we turn our eye uh, to Dubai, to the United Arab Emirates, it is a thrill to address you guys today. I just wanna say thank you. Thank you to you as a congregation. Thank you to uh, many individuals. Some of you, uh, especially deacons, helped us smog our car when we were traveling. Thank you to those who um, helped us with our kids. Thank you so much for bringing meals when we um, have brought our two kids, Kakoli and Ethan, back from uh, India back in December. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you for your, your faithful giving. Thank you to you as our friends, our brothers, our sisters, for as we go to Dubai, um, as we go to train leaders in the United Arab Emirates, you go with us as our partners, as our friends. And so we're thankful for you. You know, as, uh, as I mentioned, we go to the United Arab Emirates to, do, to join a church called Redeemer Church and to raise up leaders. But rather than hear me tell you a little about it, I want you to see it and then hear it from themselves. So... Global Christianity needs a reformation. Around the world, the advance of the gospel is hindered by unbiblical teaching, false doctrine, and poor missiology. We've tried to move so fast in missions that syncretism has been the result. We need to slow down because we need leaders, leaders who are indigenous to this region, who rightly handle the word of truth, who preach and teach the whole counsel of God, who work hard, to build healthy churches. And so we need to be willing to invest years in training and equipping pastors and church planters, theologians and writers, and lay leaders at every level. A reformation needs reformers. My name's Aaron and I'm from the Philippines. When I came to GTC, the Lord had opened the door for me to pastor a Filipino church here in Dubai. I was doing my best to lead and preach faithfully, but I didn't really know how. I had never been trained. I quit my corporate life in 2013 in response to just an overwhelming burden and desire God put, especially for communities that I grew up in, where scripture was not at the center of it. I'm studying at GTC so I can more effectively lead my small group of women here in Dubai so that down the line, I can be a part of gospel-centered church plant in my own home country. The modern, fast-growing global cities of the Gulf region are a remarkably strategic context for the gospel's advance. The UAE is not only located in the heart of the least reached region of the world, but is also a place where 90% of the population comes from other nations, where English is a primary language, and where we have the freedom of religion. God has created something unique in the Gulf. In 2015, Redeemer Church was five years old and we had seen the Lord work in incredible ways to save sinners and to gather a church of 1,000 in attendance from 60 different nations. But we longed for more. As we saw God bringing together believers from every tribe and tongue and nation, we longed for this place to become a sending hub from which we could send indigenous believers to plant and lead gospel preaching churches out in their own contexts. But first, they need to be equipped. And so we started dreaming big, making plans, and soon the Gulf Training Center was born. And I think I found answers to what I was looking to. Now, coming from an itinerant ministry and thinking that was the best way to go about preaching the gospel, that began changing. I saw the need for faithful preaching and teaching with intentional discipleship in the context of the local church. 
Africa. There is so much more uh, I have come to learn. There's so much more I have gained during this time. There are better understanding and handling of the Bible uh, that I think speaks more into even the theology or the knowledge I was seeking to acquire in the first place. When I study God's Word now, it's a wonderful experience to observe the text carefully, see the tense and prepositions used, interpret the text for what it would have meant for the readers then and how it applies to us now. I'm so encouraged now to read the Bible with other women or explain it in a simpler way to the children. Um, I remember a class entitled New Testament Exegesis and Preaching where we learn to use the languages, the grammar of the Greek language. With that learning, with that kind of knowledge, I was able to hone my preaching and be able also to share that lesson that I learned to other churches, particularly to a partner church that we have in Abu Dhabi. Our Lord is the one who's doing this work, and He's truly done more than we can ever ask or think. In 2016, 15 students began the MDiv program. And as they've continued over the years, we've been able to add even more options for other students with a variety of MA degrees, our popular foundations program. Now we have opportunities not only for pastors and church planners, but in biblical counseling and women's ministry and general biblical and theological study to serve the church. Now in our fifth school year, the Lord has multiplied the work tenfold with 150 currently enrolled students coming from more than 20 different countries. GTC has been able to have a wide impact on the church in the UAE with several hundred believers over the years taking at least one course. But the best days of equipping the saints are still ahead of us. The Lord continues to bring students from many different churches and many different countries to come and to study. The Lord is building our team here with three amazing new full-time professors, one here now, others coming later this year. The Lord's brought the opportunity to launch our second campus in Abu Dhabi through a partnership with Evangelical Community Church there. We're pursuing accreditation through the European Council for Theological Education. And now, in recognition of all that the Lord has done, today we're announcing to you our new name. Gulf Training Center is officially becoming Gulf Theological Seminary. The seminary is the normal word known worldwide for an educational institution that trains students for ministry in the local church. And with this new name, Gulf Theological Seminary, we're acknowledging that a seminary is what God has brought about in this strategic place, and we're inviting our fellow Christians to come and to be equipped. We are not signaling a change in direction, but continuing on the path that we've always been on, world-class, church-dependent theological education designed for Christians in this region. We would love to have you as a part of Gulf Theological Seminary. We want to see pulpits aflame with the glory of Christ as God's word is faithfully proclaimed. When the word of God is faithfully proclaimed, it creates churches under the authority of the word where the Lord Jesus Christ is cherished, worshiped, and honored as he should be. At Gulf Theological Seminary, we are committed to training and equipping leaders for this reformation. May the Lord continue to raise up students for GTS and may he act through this ministry and through the church to create a ripple effect for the gospel that resounds throughout this region by his grace for his glory. Father in heaven, we come to you and thank you that there is a revival of churches in the middle of the Middle East. Gracious God, we thank you that despite what our eyes see or what maybe we read in the news, that you are saving people, drawing them from darkness to your marvelous light, that you are bringing them together in local churches, and for the glory of Jesus Christ, you are raising up more and more men to lead churches in the Middle East, in North Africa, in South Asia. And this, this morning, Father, even as we, we bow before you and open up your word, we want you to teach us. We want you to show us in your word what it means to be on mission, what it means to prepare pastors, what it means to plant churches. So, Father, use your word now. Use your spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you saw in the video there, we, we launched this this weekend. It becomes the Gulf 
Theological Seminary uh, today and tomorrow is our kind of our official launch. It's pretty fun. Um, it's pretty exciting to be a part of it, and, and so we're thrilled that we get to go there very shortly. Uh, June 1st, we transition to the Gulf, and so you can pray for us over the next five weeks uh, because of a lot of packing to do. Uh, we have, we're still trying to guide our children through what is Dubai. One of our kids is like, is Dubai, is that like in the East Coast? Of California, like East Coast of the U.S. No, 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 it's another country. And so we have, we have a lot of things that we, we're, we're preparing and, and putting together, and so we appreciate your prayers, as I'll talk about maybe in just a little bit. Um, we need to raise up elders, to train pastors, to equip church leaders, because this is a missionary mandate. It's a missionary mandate to raise up leadership for the church, men who know the word, who love God fiercely, who hold up God's word highly, it is not just about preaching the gospel to Hindus or to disciple a Muslim background believer, both critical components of missionary life. It's also to call people to obedience and gathering together as the church and to raise up people who can preach and teach the Bible well. Now, for just a moment, though, I want to take us back maybe to the, to the beginning of the church. You know, Jesus Christ Matthew 28, he commissions his people, his disciples to go. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now that is not actually a missionary text, right? That's a text given to all of us. It's a Christian text that we make disciples. So we make disciples in Dubai. You make disciples here in Santa Clarita because we have heard Jesus speak and we obey. Now 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, you know, the Holy Spirit came down and empowered the people of God and filled the people of God and, and the church was born. And we know that anyone who turns to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and, and confesses their sins and, and turns to him in hope because of the death and resurrection of Christ, that they become a Christian and they receive the power of the Holy Spirit too. And even today, this morning, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in simple faith, you have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now we learn through the book of Acts, Acts 2 and 4, that when Christians gather together for the breaking of bread, for prayer, for fellowship, for hearing the word of God preached, for service, that when they do that regularly, it's called church. And so we are the church of God here, constructed of living stones, a, a living temple. And as together we fellowship around the word of God and we break bread and we encourage one another as long as the day is, we are the people of God. Amen? Amen. Now the very first missionary, the very first missionary in the history of the church, right? Paul the apostle in Acts 13 and 14 goes out and he's preaching the gospel and he's proclaiming the truth and he's calling people to repentance. And then the thing that I love about the, that, that section is what he does at the end of that very first missionary journey is he goes back to all the cities that he had visited and in each city that he goes to, he gathers, the, gather, he gathers the, the people, the Christians together, and he appoints or he affirms elders in each city. Because Paul knows that the best strategy for making disciples, the best vision, you might say, for bringing about transformation in the world is to start new churches. And to plant a new church, you need to have an equipped leader. You need to have elders, pastors who know the word, who, who love God, and who are walking in holiness. That, in a nutshell, my friends, is biblical Christianity, right? In, in a, th a thousand languages, on every inhabitable continent, among countless millions, even billions of people, the church slowly, steadily grows. And we are a part of it here. We're a part of it here because God loves the church. We are the people of God. We are our, his beloved bride, his multivariegated gifted body. You are the church. You are the ones that God loves and through whom he is making his name known, the name of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to say today, glory in the grace of God because you are his much loved people. And God wants more. God wants more churches to be planted. And even as you, you saw the pastor up there, churches that plant churches that plant churches. The Lord desires that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted throughout the whole world among the many peoples who have yet to hear 
of the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see this mandate, this missionary mandate to plant more churches and, and, and to prepare pastors from the word of God itself. And so if you'll open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be looking at God's mission by planting churches. God's mission, we might say, by preparing pastors, by equipping elders. We'll see God's program for preparing pastors here. Three key aspects I want you to see. First, the content of pastoral preparation. Uh, preparation, that means uh, what is the deposit? We're going to see an entrustment and deposit. We're going to see number two of the pattern of pastoral preparation. How is the deposit to be so entrusted? Is there a vision? Is there a strategy about, uh, about how God is going to do this or desires for us to do it? We also see the identity here of pastors prepared. Who is entrusted with this deposit and so made a pastor? And even as we talk about these things, we'll also see how those who maybe aren't called to be elders or pastors might also glean and learn, how can I also represent Jesus Christ in the world? And so let's look here at 2 Timothy 2.2. We'll begin in verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened or be strong by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You know, Paul's program here is deceptively simple, right? Paul commands Timothy to give or to endow or to invest in a certain group of people called faithful, called faithful men, an entrustment, an endowment. And, and then those people are not supposed to keep it to themselves, but then they in turn are to look for other people who are faithful and they are to give to those people that, that same deposit or that same in, entrustment, that same endowment. And all of this happens within the sphere or the context of the local church. It's deceptively simple. It's, it's not that complicated, right? Now let's look at the content of pastoral preparation. What is this deposit? That word there, entrust, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to others. We see this word entrust or deposit come up several times in the pastoral epistles, first and second Timothy and Titus. And so you might say that this morning, we're gonna, we're gonna several times be flipping back and forth on the pastorals because we wanna see what is this entrustment? What is this deposit that, that an elder or pastor must have taken, must have deposited, you might say, into their, into their mind, into their heart? Well, I want, to, I want to give you six things that are entrusted, and we're going to go through these pretty quick. You know, we're going to go through this, this deposit pretty quick. Now, a deposit, you might ask, what's a deposit? That's not typically a phrase that we use in, in, uh, every day. What's an entrustment? Entrustment is a, a compendium. It's a, a treasury. It's, it can be a literal kind of property. It could be a figurative kind of property. You know, I've, I've got a daughter who likes to collect stuff, and she likes to put that stuff in a cardboard box. And if you come to my, uh, my house and you want to take something from that cardboard box, she will defend it. She will say, this is my stuff. I have entrusted it to my box, do not touch it. She has deposited it, she likes it, she wants it. It's her, it's, it's her things there. And so I wanna give you six things that are deposited, things, six things that are entrusted to an elder or to a pastor or to a church leader. And you see there, the first one is right here in the text. He says, what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. This likely refers to some official formal time where Paul um, spoke over or prayed over Timothy in the presence of other people. He was affirmed or he was um, appointed as a delegate, as a leader um, in the church. And Paul says, remember that time when I spoke and when I prayed for you or when I affirmed you in the presence of many witnesses? What you heard then, you're going to now give to others. Now deposit that, give that to other people. And in this same frame mindset, we have this idea that Paul, over the course of many years, at, at this point, at least 10 years, has spent countless hours with Timothy. Countless sermons Timothy has heard Paul preach. Countless times the word read. Uh, the countless times they probably have prayed and fasted together. Countless times as they've walked from church to city, from city to church, Timothy has heard Paul preach and teach. And we have this idea that all that Paul has communicated over the course of these many years to Timothy, Timothy is now to take. And he's not to keep it for himself. He's not just to, to write it down or to have a, like a library in his, in his head, but he's actually to turn it around now and to entrust it or give it to other people, to other people. And so we see here, 
what you've heard from me, Paul says, and trust to others. Number two, though, we see something else. We see the testimony concerning Jesus Christ. The testimony concerning Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8. We'll pick it up there. Verse 8, 2 Timothy 1. Paul says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, right? So don't be ashamed about what happened to Jesus Christ and about the death and resurrection. Don't, don't be ashamed about this, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, if we were to track through this whole passage, when we get to verse 12, we're talking about the same thing. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard unto that day what has been, do you see the word there? What has been entrusted to me? And what has been entrusted to Paul? The testimony concerning Jesus Christ. But then look at verse 14. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So Paul has the entrustment of the the testimony concerning Jesus Christ. And it's also been now entrusted to Timothy. And he's going to take this and give this to other people. You know, Dubai is a very diverse place. Literally 90% of the people come from somewhere else. And that, in that kind of diversity, you have a lot of Hindus, a lot of Muslims, a lot of religion undecided. And on a Friday morning when they gather for corporate worship, many walk into a church for the first time and they hear the gospel for the first time. And so that's why we need men and women who love the gospel, who love the testimony concerning Jesus Christ, who are not ashamed of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and who can speak about it and articulate it. And so I just wonder today, do you love the gospel? Do you love the testimony concerning Jesus Christ? Does it flow from your lips? If someone were to walk in here today and say, hey, what, what's the testimony concerning Jesus? Would it just, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't hold it back because it is so a part of your life and your identity. Sometimes I wonder, I wonder if one of the reasons why we're sometimes so hesitant to speak the gospel is we haven't actually talked about it very much recently. Oh, the man or the woman who's got God's heart, who's been entrusted with the testimony, speaks it, knows it, and loves it. But there's more here, right? In uh, in the the pastorals, there's a, a strong emphasis on the word of God. And so all scripture, the word of God is going to be entrusted or deposited to, into the heart and the hands of that church leader. Like 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, you know, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Profitable for what? For teaching and for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The very next verse, Paul gives a command, turns it around and says, I charge you, therefore, preach the word. And so every aspiring elder, every aspiring church leader, if they're a village pastor in Kenya, if they're an urban pastor in one of the world's largest cities, New Delhi or Lahore, Pakistan, what do they have to be able to do? They have to know the word and they must be able to preach it, to preach it accurately, powerfully, according to the word. But there's more here, right? We're running through these pretty quick. I want you to see them. The deposit, what will Timothy entrust to a group of faithful men? What has been given to him through Paul in the presence of many witnesses? The the testimony concerning Jesus. All scripture or the word of God. We also see sound doctrine. And for that, look over to uh, Titus chapter one. We could just flip over to Titus a couple pages. Paul writing to Titus chapter one, verse nine. Paul writes, he, an elder, a pastor, must, be, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Why? So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. And so here we see that it's not just the word, right? He must know the word, but he must know the word so that he can give instruction in sound doctrine. Now, sound doctrine, theology, are the truths or the ideas built upon the word that help us to understand what God is like. That's why we love theology. We love to know and to think about God because we love God. We want to experience more of his life in us. We want to understand better how can we encourage others to know about what God is like. And we call that doctrine. 
sound doctrine, theology, by which we come to think God's thoughts after he thinks. We want to think like God, right? We want to have good, solid, sound doctrine. And an elder who can't um, instruct in doctrine is not been entrusted with this deposit or doesn't understand it or, or isn't, isn't fulfilling the, the call that God has for his life. Now, Dubai, we have a, there's a lot of people there from a lot of different backgrounds. It is a kaleidoscope of culture and tradition. It's a kaleidoscope of, of different backgrounds. And I gotta tell you that so many people, when they come to the gathered church and they begin to hear good theology, their eyes are opened their heart is aflame as they get to begin to hear about the grace of God. And they get excited about theology for the first time. They've, they've never been excited about theology and they begin to hear doctrine. And they say, wow, I want more of this. One such man named Butchen, John Butchen, he was from South India. And for 20 years, he was an IT engineer um, in Dubai. And as he heard and sat under the word of God being taught and heard doctrine, he said his eyes were just open. He got, he got so excited and he thought, I have to take this back to the churches in, in where I'm from in South India because I've, we didn't hear any of this stuff before. And so he started taking classes and he started became, being mentored by um, people at Redeemer Church and, and very slowly he learned theology himself and they entrusted to Butchen these things, what was heard in the presence of many witnesses and, and the word of God and the testimony concerning Jesus and sound doctrine. And Butchen said, this is about two, three years ago, he said to the elders, I, I, I wanna go back now actually to South India. I wanna see a church there that teaches the word of God and sound doctrine. And so they, they've entrusted him with these things and now they wanna send him back there so that he can pastor in, him, in the city in which he grew up because he's taken sound a doctrine into his heart and he wants others to know it. But there's more. There's more that's entrusted. Look back at Titus verse, uh, chapter one, that same verse. Because it says there, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Look down at verse 13. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And so a, an elder or a pastor, a church leader, will not only love and know sound doctrine, but they'll be able also to refute or rebuke error. It's not, a just, it's not enough to, to positively commend the truth unless we are also at the same time saying, this over here is wrong, don't go that way. That path leads to destruction. And so the aspiring elder, the pastor who desires to lead the church of God, will be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke or to refute that which leads to destruction. There's one more aspect of the entrustment that I wanna so want you to see in the scriptures and that we wanna talk about. I want you to see that in Titus 2, and look there, because we see some similar words here. Paul says, but as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. I want you to notice here, he doesn't say, teach sound doctrine. He's already said that. He says, teach three words, what accords with sound doctrine. So this last point, what what does Paul desire Timothy to entrust or to deposit to others? He says, teach what accords with sound, what accords with sound doctrine here? Well, if you look the, the the rest of the chapter, chapter two, and you look into chapter three, we see here, ethical, moral, lifestyle-like commands. We see almost 30 commands. Paul piles on how you flesh out the gospel, how you flesh out doctrine and theology matters. Paul desires that an elder or a pastor or church leader or actually all of us, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, that we'd have a lifestyle of holiness and humility. I mean, look back there at at Titus chapter 2. He says, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Verse two, older men, what are they to do? They're to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, sound in love, sound in steadfastness. And if we were to go and and walk through this entire chapter, in chapter three, we would see that that God desires us to have a, a certain kind of life. A life consumed with Christ, a life of holiness 
and humility. It's not just enough to know doctrine, particularly for young people. We, we begin to read books and we get all excited about all that we were gathering, all the intellectual things that we're learning. And perhaps, young person, you are tempted to think doctrine is the best thing or the only thing. Yeah, be brilliant in the Bible. Memorize the Institutes of Christian Religion, check plus, but God desires your entire life to conform to godliness, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to sound doctrine. And so what's, what's entrusted? What is it that when we go to the Gulf Theological Seminary that we want to deposit in the men that will be there training? What have they heard? What have we heard in the presence of many witnesses? the testimony concerning Jesus Christ, the gospel, the word of God to be preached and taught, sound doctrine, to give instruction in sound doctrine, to be able to refute or rebuke error and a pattern or a life of godliness. This is the content of the entrustment. This is the content of pastoral preparation. And, and so we have a desire uh, to go there, a design to raise men and, um, and church leaders up so that they can have this and then thus give it to others. And that leads me maybe to a second point that I want you to see here. That is to say the pattern of pastoral preparation. How is the deposit to be so entrusted? What strategy or pattern do we see here? Do we see a strategy a pattern here in, in 2 Timothy 2. And I want you to see, you see the statement maybe up there. Equipping pastors and elders usually happens through a long process of mentoring in the church. Paul mentored Timothy. He expects Timothy to do the same thing, to, to mentor others. He expects that Timothy is gonna follow the same general pattern of entrustment or endowment or deposit that Paul practiced. And what did Paul do? Paul discipled, Paul preached, Paul prayed, Paul fasted, Paul lived and died with Timothy. And Paul expects that Timothy's gonna do something very, very similar. Now I want you to see it here um, in the pastorals. What I'm saying right now is that, is that going away to a seminary and having some set of formal education is not what actually makes someone a pastor or an elder or a church leader. It can be very beneficial, right? But it's not the New Testament's primary model. You know, having an MDiv, a Master's of Divinity, um, having a certain personality is not what makes a man a minister. What is then the pattern or the strategy for how a man enters into pastoral leadership? Well, let's look here together. How are church leaders made? By a long, intentional process of mentorship, of entrustment, of endowing. Look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Right in the middle, I skipped over it just a few minutes ago. Paul says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me. Sound words, the sound doctrine that I reference to. Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and in the love that are in Christ Jesus. Look at 2 Timothy 3.10. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul writes, You, however, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct. You followed my aim in life, my faith. You followed my patience and my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Look down at verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed. Continue in what you have followed. This isn't going to change. It's not like once you become in church leadership, therefore, now we're gonna, we're gonna switch tracks. We're gonna switch paths. No, 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 we're gonna continue to follow that which we've learned. And Timothy, Timothy, the way that he's going to equip new elders for the churches of, of, of Ephesus and the way that Titus is gonna appoint and affirm for leadership for the churches in Crete and, and what we're gonna try to do in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Raik Achaim and, and perhaps back in India is to equip men, church leaders, by pouring into them intentionally over the course of many years. It takes time to saturate someone with the scripture. It takes time to get to know them and, and what they're like because we're, we're not just mentoring their minds, right? We're trying to cultivate their hearts. It takes a long time of intentional, thoughtful love to guide a man into ministry. Pastoral ministry, as you know, involves a great deal 
of, of different kinds of things, teaching and preaching and counseling and visitation, and, and it takes a team often to, to bring about these kinds of things, and yet the main method is gonna be loving, intentional mentorship. It reminds me, though, of those football, those football playbooks. You know, I'm, I'm told that a, a successful football team has, a, has a, a lot of playbooks, and in those playbooks, there are all of their secret codes in place so they can win, and so there's lots of X and O's, and you go this way and faint and reverse, and you flip and I should be talking, let someone else talk about football playbooks, right? Um, Paul's strategy is not so complex. There are no feints. There are no reversals. Paul says, give this deposit to faithful men. And then those faithful men give it to faithful men, who then give it to faithful men. It's pretty straightforward. Needage. Needage came to Lucknow about six years ago because he wanted to become a, a, a leader, a pastor of a local church. And he joined Satyavachan Church and, and began to study the Word of God. And after about two years, he applied to Satyavachan Seminary, the seminary that we started over there. And he said, I want to I learn and study the Bible. And yet, he said, the reason why I've come here is not just because you teach verse by verse exposition. He said, I do want to know that. But I came here because you get to know the very cells of the, of the body of your students. You intentionally grab hold of and own their life. And he said to the leadership at the time, he said, I want you to own me so that I can belong to Jesus Christ. What Needage captured there was he, he knew that that to be fit for the kingdom, to be fit for the purposes of God as a pastor, he would need a variety of people to pour into him over a course of time so that he would be faithful. And so I guess, I mean, I just want to ask you guys, are, are you involved in intentional relationships, intentional men, mentorship? Or are you engaged or involved with others so that they can pour into you, so that you can pour into them? I, I need you right? As an individual. You need me as an individual. We need each other so that we might grow in Christ. And so I want to ask you, who are you mentoring? And who is mentoring you? Who are you intentionally engaging in spiritual conversation so that they might grow more like the Lord Jesus Christ? Obviously, it's not going to be everybody. You're not going to have an intentional, spiritual, spiritually in-depth conversation with another 200 people. But you're going to have some people, I hope, that you, that you know in the back of your minds, I care about this man or this woman. I desire that they would become more like Jesus Christ. Who are you mentoring? And who is mentoring you? Now, if you, if you perhaps right now, no name comes to your mind, it's probably because you're not mentoring anybody. Not yet. And so I'd say today's a day to change that. Today's a day to get out of your comfortable systems, if you're comfortable, and to say, today I'm going to start actively engaging other people so that they might grow spiritually and be more like Jesus Christ. And so you who are maybe in your 20s, grab a teenager. You who are in your 30s, grab a young marrieds. We who are in our 40s, let's look around and find out what is a young man or a young woman or a young couple that I can begin to invest in, to pour into so that they might be more like Jesus Christ. Maybe you'll take one of these aspects of the deposit that we've talked about, sound doctrine, being able to refute error, um, a, a life or a pattern of godliness. And maybe you'll take one of those things and say, I want others to know this aspect of the word of God. And so today, start. Think about, even now perhaps, who can you call? Who can you begin to text or to message? In fact, I maybe want to go maybe a one little step closer into practice. And so I want you to think about a name. Who is somebody that you might call, that you might begin to engage for an in-depth spiritual relationship that you might, so that you might see them grow in the, the, the deposit, in the entrustment of of. God's word. I mean, like, literally take out a pen or write in your Evernote file a name. Begin, ask, ask God, 
Lord, who have you put in my life that I can begin to talk about spiritual things? Who can I begin to talk about the things that I'm struggling with or working through? And then write their name down. And then today, perhaps text or email them or call them. Because if you don't start today or this week, you're you're probably going to forget. And other things, other competing ideas will come. And you won't remember again what it's like to, to entrust the deposit to anybody else. Who are you going to mentor? And who is going to mentor you? We've talked a little bit about the content of pastoral preparation. We've talked a little bit about the pattern or the strategy of pastoral preparation. I want to give you one more point. That is the identity of pastors prepared. Who is entrusted with this deposit and so made an elder? Who is entrusted? Well, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2-2 two, two, gives us just one adjective, just one word here. He says they are faithful. He calls them faithful to describe about uh, the one that is going to receive this deposit or this entrustment. The future leaders in Ephesus and in Crete are going to be faithful people. Well, I love this word faithful, don't you? Someone who's reliable, someone who's who's dependent. There's one translation I like that describes this word as competent, spiritually competent people or you're going to give the word to. Someone who, is, who can reliably uphold the truth and godliness. A faithful man. Now, there are qualifications for the office of elder, right? We see those in 1 Timothy 3. We see those in Titus 1. They furnish for us a, a collage of characteristics, a, a picture of what it means to be a pastor. Well, I see, I see Paul as kind of summarizing that whole chapter in 1 Timothy 3 here in one word faithful. Timothy, find faithful men and give to those faithful men this deposit or this entrustment. Now, not everyone is faithful, right? Not everyone is qualified to pastor. Not everyone is, is, should be equipped as an elder. Uh, two years ago, I applied for a credit card a credit card, just a, a really basic one, actually the, the, the lowest kind of credit card. And I got a denial letter. They wrote me and said, you have no credit history. You know, being in India for 15 years, we had no credit cards, we had no debt. And so I didn't, we had no credit. And they wrote me and said, you are not qualified for this credit card. Eventually, I, I was able to beg and plead and get a credit card. But it just shocked me that you could be not qualified for a credit card. Well, there are there's a way you can be not qualified to elder or pastor. And actually, in First and Second Timothy and Titus, we actually read some names of people. These were real flesh and blood people that, that had abused spiritual authority or that were teaching falsely. And you can see in Second Timothy 1.15, Phagellus and Homogenes, they turned away from Paul. They were ashamed of his chains, ashamed of the testimony concerning Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.16, Hymenaeus and Philetus trapped in the false teaching. They said that the resurrection had already happened and they were trying to trap others in this deception and this falsehood. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, Demas in love with the world deserted Paul. I, for me, it's hard to read of these people, these flesh and blood, these real historical people, some of whom were friends of Paul, and not think that in a congregation of this size, perhaps there are people right here, perhaps you, like Demas, are on the fence. You love Jesus and Christ and the congregation sometimes, but then in reality, the world is competing for your heart, and you, like Demas, perhaps might desert the faith. Paul is aware that there are people like Philetius and Demas or Alexander the Cropper Smith. Unfaithful men, false teachers even. Oh, that we would be men and women that are faithful. And so question for you men, brothers, Grandfathers, sons, are you faithful? 
Are you full of faith, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, goodness? Are you marked by faithfulness? Or, or is there some secret sin that, that's holding you back, that prevents you from a, a, a robust, full-hearted faith uh, and, and expression of your faith in Jesus Christ? Is there some habit of speech with your wife? Is there some long-buried bitterness that causes you to turn inward? Are you faithful? Because I want you to be faithful. Paul wants you to be faithful. God desires that you would be faithful. Now, not everyone is called to be an elder, right? Not everyone is called to be a pastor. Some of you are called to be teachers or drummers or to fulfilling a number of different callings beautifully to the glory of God. But you are called to be faithful. Does faithfulness mark your life? If you had one word to describe yourself, if you could choose one word to describe yourself, how would you describe yourself? Ambitious, focused, happy, hardworking. How would you, if you had the choice, the ability, to describe your entire life in one word, what would you choose? Paul, I think, I submit to you, would choose this word. As, as, a, as a worthy word, are you faithful? What holds you back? What prevents you? You know, a word on the gender of these faithful people in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul worked with many women over the course of many years. Uh, Phoebe and, and Junia and Lydia. Even in Philippians 4.3, he calls uh, Udiah and Syntyche. He says, they labored with me side by side um, in the gospel. Paul commends the deep-seated faith of uh, Timothy's grandmother and of his mom in this book, 2 Timothy 1. I mean, can you imagine hearing your own name written in Scripture for thousands of years, faithful or godly? I mean, that's basically what Paul did about, about uh, Timothy's mom and grandma. I mean, it's amazing. You know, the New Testament deeply values the work and contribution of, of women in the local church, which is why at least the GTS we have the desire in the first two years to invite women to come and learn how to, how to read and study and teach the Bible so that in women's meetings or with children or in a variety of different ways, they can serve the word, serve the Lord in, in ways that will build up people in the church. However, in the context of 2 Timothy, uh, we see the local church. In 2 Timothy 2 in particular, we have church leadership. And so for all that women did then and continue to do in the life of the local church, women are never called pastors or elders. And even in 1 Timothy 3, the focus there is very specific uh, as to male leadership. Now that God designed church leadership to consist of men does not in any way undermine the contribution or the goodness of women serving women or women serving in any number of capacities. And so maybe I just want to take a moment and ask you, women, mothers, sisters, daughters, are you faithful? Are you full of faith? Is, is, what, what would prevent you from being called faithful like Lois or Eunice? What, what thought pattern or pattern of speech or what aspect of your parenting would need to change so that Paul would look at you and say, yes, Timothy, she is a faithful woman. You are not called the pastor or elder, but you are called, like the rest of us, to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of grace. Are you faithful? Now, some of you men and women perhaps sense some burden, some some feeling of shame or guilt because you know deep down that you are not faithful. You know that deep down you are actually faithless. Perhaps this morning or yesterday you did it again. You, you went into some habit or some exercise of thought that you know dishonors the Lord. And so you, even now you feel some weight of burden. You, you sense in your conscience the grief of the Holy Spirit well, I have good news for you. Brother, sister, I have good news for you 
Because if you feel heavy burdened and heavy laden because of sin and guilt and shame, there is a Savior, Jesus Christ. And he says, come to me if you are weary and heavy laden. Receive my faithfulness, that Jesus Christ has received my work of finished on the cross and my resurrection power and, and be forgiven of sins. He loves you, Christian. He died for you, Christian. He rose from the dead for you, Christian, so that you might walk in newness of life. And so today, if you feel some sense of faithlessness, run to him. Confess to him and receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he offers it to you freely. If you feel faithless, look down at verse 11 in 2 Timothy 2. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You know, the point of all of this is you want to be the kind of person, young or old, man, woman, that that Timothy would look at and say, faithful, come, come, learn, engage with me this great ministry of calling people to faith and obedience, come. You want to be the kind of person that, that Paul says, come, work with me side by side, labor in the gospel. Let's, let's plant churches for the glory of God in the, in the Middle East. You want to be the kind of person that, that calls people to faith and has a, has a life of godliness because God has worked in us, in your heart, grace. You want to be faithful. You can pray for us in this regard. We want to be faithful so you can pray for my wife and I as we go. You can pray for the team. Some of the men um, that you saw up there are our teammates as we go to the, uh, the golf. They will be working with them. Pray that we would be faithful. Pray that we would be faithful to raise up men and women to, to work in various ways in the local church, specifically for men in pastoral leadership. We need wisdom. Pray that we would know who is faithful that we can help them walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Pray for more and more faithful pastors here in Santa Clarita. Pray for more and more faithful pastors for the United Arab Emirates. You can pray because in so doing, as you send us, you join us. You, you partner with us in the deepening and the broadening of the, the kingdom of God in the local church. You participate with us in God's mission to the world of saving sinners. And so, maybe even as I conclude, I just want to say, praise God for what he's doing in your lives and your hearts. Because through your prayers, through your faith, you get to see and experience God's kingdom incrementally grow into another city, through another church, through another set of families, by the grace of God. Will you pray with me now? Father in heaven, we come to you right now because of the faithfulness of Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might be your righteousness, righteous in your grace. And so we come to you, Heavenly Father, because Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled your will. He perfectly obeyed. He perfectly walked in the spirit of holiness. And so we can receive his righteousness. And even right now, Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. I think they're, they're of those who do feel burdened by perhaps life's circumstance or, or some grievous burden, some bitterness of old, some guilt of our shame of, of things said or done. And Lord, all of us, we come to you and we say, Lord, help us by your grace. Be men and women of faithfulness. And glorious God, I just think, I think of the, the many cities right now spread throughout the Middle East, South Asia, we know them well, Lord. Villages and cities where there is no church, where there are no Christians, let alone a a good, strong, healthy church. Father in heaven, 
we just ask in the, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit that you would bring a revival of church planting throughout the Middle East, throughout South Asia, so that we might see more and more churches beholding Christ, seeing and savoring Christ, so that all the nations, Hindus and Muslims and religion undecided, would, would turn and see the glory and the supremacy of Jesus Christ through your people of whom even now, Lord, we represent. We are your people, Lord. We, we praise you and thank you for your faithfulness and your grace. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one last hymn this morning, How Great Thou Art.
are indeed great. We praise you that your mission, your gospel is going around the world, throughout the world, and is slowly, step by step, saving, transforming, that you are building your church, Lord. Um, we are so grateful and humbled to, through being obedient to you and being faithful in the power of the Spirit to participate in that. We thank you this morning, Lord, in particular for TJ and Karen and their family. We pray that you would bless their ministry greatly, that you would give much fruit of the gospel and much fruit of their labor, Lord, in Dubai, and that you would continue to make your name great and greater still there. Lord, help us to love one another today as your body, to reach out to one another, to build each other up, to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens, to pray for one another, Lord, and to be the church, and as such, to grow and to see your kingdom expand. We love you so much, Lord, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed.